a very warm welcome to this discussion forum on new findings on the dynamics between forests, land use and food security, jointly hosted by IUFROAD, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations, and CIFOR, the Center for International Forestry Research. Um, Roman philosopher and writer Seneca once said that we do, in fact, not have too little time. It's just that we waste too much time. So I, you do have my assurance that this discussion forum will be an excellent investment of your precious time. My name is Alexander Buck. I am the executive director of IUFRO, of the International Union for Forest Research Organizations. Um, not all of you may be aware of IUFRO. It's uh, the leading global network for forest science collaboration. The network brings together about 650 member organizations in virtually all corners of the world. Uh, these are universities, research institutions dealing in one way or the other with issues related, with research related to forest trees. Altogether, we do have member organizations in more than 120 countries, uniting about 15,000 scientists. So that was the, the kind of pro, the, the advertisement for my own organization. UFRO is a member of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests, which supports, as you know, the Global Landscapes Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the issue which we are going to discuss today, I believe, is a very relevant one. Faced with a likely a population, a likely global population of over 9 billion by 2050, issues of food security and nutrition have now indeed very prominently entered both the scientific and the political agenda especially in relation to the discussion on the post-2015 development uh, agenda. As many of you will be aware, the United Nations Secretary General has proposed a very ambitious goal to eliminate global hunger by 2025, the so-called Zero Hunger Challenge. Of course, meeting this challenge is a complex undertaking, and as any complex undertaking, this requires good, profound scientific knowledge. Against that background, a panel of scientific experts from around the world has been tasked by the Collaborative Partnership on Forests with carrying out a comprehensive global scientific assessment of published scientific information about the role of forests and trees for food security and nutrition. And this event here actually gives some kind of a sneak preview of the findings that are emerging from that global study on the contribution of forests to food security and nutrition. At the discussion forum, uh, you will learn about the scope of the assessments, the emerging key findings, and I should say that the final report will be launched at the 11th session of the United Nations Forum on Forests, which will be held in May 2015 in New York at the UN headquarters. Uh, first, please uh, allow me to briefly outline the program of the discussion forum. We will uh, first have brief introductory remarks by the newly appointed director of the United Nations Forum on Forest Secretariat, Mr. Manuel Sobral Filho. Manuel, a very warm welcome. We will then have three brief presentations by our leading panel members, uh, followed by statements by three respondents, and that it will be, then it will be your turn. Then we want to have an open discussion with the panelists, and then you're free to direct your questions to the panelists and the respondents and also respond yourself to some of the information that will be presented at this forum. I should also mention that the results of our discussion will not get lost. They will be documented. They will be included in the report of the Global Landscapes Forum. And for this purpose, Dr. Valerie Kapos, who heads the climate change and biodiversity program at UNEP WCMC, has kindly agreed to serve as a rapporteur for our session. Well, where are you? Uh, over here. So we will take good notes of our session. Without further ado, I would now like to invite Mr. Sobral Filio to provide opening remarks. Uh, Manuel, the floor is yours. Good afternoon to all of you. Alexander, thank you very much for the kind invitation to briefly address uh, this important group of people here. Uh, colleagues here in the, in the panel. Uh, it's really an honor to be here uh, with you today and uh, a broader institute in Iquitos. So we are here uh, in beautiful Lima, but we are still a bit far from the Amazon forest. But in any way, it's, it's, it's very fitting that we are here. Uh, it's 
really uh, a, a, an opportunity for me to, to take the floor and, and thank very much the, the uh, C4 and uh, IUFU for taking the leadership, particularly IUFU, on this uh, uh, Global Forest uh, Expert Panel initiative. Uh, we are in a time that uh, a, a more informed uh, decisions have to be taken. We are in a crucial time now uh, where we are shaping the, uh, the, the future of, uh, of sustainable development issues. And uh, I, I think this uh, panel uh, has already done great work uh, in a few subjects, including uh, issues such as, such as climate change adaptation, forest governance, and forest biodiversity and REGD. Uh, so uh, the work of, of this panel is uh, extremely important uh, when we are now uh, uh, having uh, scientific assessments of high, of the highest quality to support the, the, the negotiation process internationally. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the thematic panels have addressed the, the several crucial issues and they have to find their way into the high level uh, dialogues that uh, the international community is going through right now. Uh, uh, Science-based uh, information is exactly what we, we need in this crucial time. Uh, as the future of sustainable development issues uh, is being shaped in the uh, new SDGs, you know, the post-2015 development agenda, uh, and also, I mean, and I would say is, is not, is, the, is more important for us, for the forest community, uh, the, the future of the international arrangement on forests. In May, the, uh, the, the, the members of the forum will meet in New York to decide its future, and several options are uh, on the table, including, including, and it's not that, it's including a legally binding negotiations on a legally binding agreement on forest. It may not come, but then we have we have an opportunity for negotiations uh, when uh, you know other important events are being uh, are shaping the future, including the the third international conference on financing for development. So there are all of these uh, events uh, will need uh, better informed decisions. Uh, we in the UNFF, uh, as well as our partners in the CPF, are working to ensure that forests are placed high on the development priorities of the post-2015 agenda. Uh, forests have, uh, in the process, of course, not been finalized yet, but that's at this stage where we are in a, in a draft, the SDGs have been agreed. Forests have been recognized as an integral part of the agenda, in particular under SDG 15 on terrestrial ecosystems, where sustainable management of forests is explicitly mentioned. Now, uh, we all know that food security is uh, and will always be part of the, the, uh, the agenda, the, the, the post-2015 agenda. And uh, the discussions on this latest uh, assessment by the GFEP on the linkage and the interdependence with forces uh, is very timely. Uh, I think we have gone beyond uh, the, the old times when the, you know, agriculture was you know, placed against forests. There's, there's, there's no such a thing. Uh, in fact, uh, just to, to end this brief intervention, I would like to recall an ancient Kashmir saying, quoted by the then director of general of FAO, Diouf, in the Antalyan uh, for the World Forest Congress, I think it was 1997. I was there, but I'm getting old, so I don't really remember the year. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the say loosely translates uh, as, uh, as lo lo loosely translated reads that food will last as long as forests do. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and, uh, and uh, wish the, the forum a successful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel, especially also for pointing out the relevance of this global study for the discussions on the Sustainable Development Goals and the post-2015 development agenda. This is indeed one of the main intentions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Obrigado. <laughs> so, um, actually, I forgot to move on with the slides here. Uh, here you have it. So here you have the list of the speakers. 
And without further ado, I would now like to um, introduce the first speaker, Dr. Christoph Wildburger. Christoph uh, coordinates the Global Forest Export Panels Initiative of the CPF uh, on behalf of UFRO, and he's now going to introduce the scope of the scientific assessment and also present to you some of the emerging findings. Christoph, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, I will briefly um, explain the background of the Global Forest Expert Panel on Forest Food Security and then uh, present the scope and uh, some emerging findings uh, of our assessment. Um, the Global Forest Expert Panel's initiative is, uh, was established by the Collaborative Partnership on Forest, as was already mentioned by Manuel and Alexander. Um, and it is led by IUFRO. It's uh, directed at the science policy interface and its mission is to support forest related intergovernmental processes by producing uh, scientific assessments on uh, issues of high concern, emerging issues of high concern. Um, the initiative establishes thematic panels for each of the topics. These panels produce assessment reports and feed the outcomes, the reports, into international policy processes. I just listed a few here, the UN, uh, United Nations Forum on Forests, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Climate Convention where we are now, and we are also um, informing the discussions on the um, Sustainable Development Goals and the post-2015 development agenda. Um, it's very important that to, to mention that uh, our um, our assessments are independent, so the panel members work independently. They do not represent any institutions or organizations. They work in their personal capacity. It's always interdisciplinary work. Uh, all reports are peer reviewed, and um, we will be scientifically sound uh, in the whole process and transparent. Um, well, what we produce is um, peer-reviewed reports, as I've said already, but also uh, policy briefs, which are uh, summaries of key messages for policymakers uh, to make it easier to, to grasp the key messages of our reports, because the full reports are uh, also directed at uh, a scientific community. So far, uh, as Manuel has already mentioned, we have um, published three reports. The first one on adaptation of forests and people to climate change. The second one on international forest governance. The third one on uh, the linkages between Red Plus and biodiversity. Um, the new forest expert panel on forest food security was established about a year ago in December 2013 by the Collaborative Partnership on Forests. About 25 leading experts from around the world um, from various scientific disciplines joined the panel. Uh, we really tried um, to select them um, according to regional and cultural diversity and also uh, keep a, a gender balance. I think especially um, referring to the topic food security and nutrition, this is a very important uh, task to get different views, even if it's uh, all scientific work. Um, currently, um, the work is at the stage that we developed the first draft of our assessment. It went into peer review already, and we are addressing peer review comments now, working on um, final draft and we just 10 days ago met and discuss, discussed uh, conclusions the first time. So uh, we are just at the stage of developing the conclusions but we try to give you a first um, glimpse of what we are, uh, of what seems to be emerging from our work. Um, Alexander has already mentioned that the, the report will be launched at UNIFF 11 in early May next year. <clears throat> I will try to explain the scope of our work um, uh, on basis 
of a conceptual framework uh, we have here. Um, uh, as you can see, um, the assess I mean, first of all, I mean, the assessment is um, investigating the interlinkages between uh, forest and tree based systems and food security and nutrition. Um, the whole assessment is a global assessment, but um, it has a slight focus, of course, on areas of the world where hunger, malnutrition, and food security um, is, a, is a serious challenge. Uh, that's why uh, you will see, if, if you read it, that there will be a slight focus on that. Um, as you can see in our conceptual framework, um, we analyze um, the status of uh, the forest, what we call the forest food system, all these interlinkages. We analyze the drivers and we analyze response options and we do analyze that um, in, at different scales, uh, the, the landscape scale, the national scale and the global scale. Um, the first part of our assessment focuses on the direct and indirect roles uh, forests play for food security and nutrition. Uh, it's a, um, a multitude of different roles. Um, and it also analyzes um, the different management and production systems and their role. That ranges from um, manipulating forests to optimize uh, the yield of certain wild foods, for example, to um, shifting cultivation, to um, uh, agroforestry practices, and then um, also to uh, um, single crop, tree crop um, uh, practices. And we analyze all these um, different management approaches and uh, um, related factors. Uh, that's the first part. And then the second part of our assessment focuses on uh, environmental, um, economic, social, and political drivers in this system. Um, and um, the third, I mean, my colleagues will then refer to that in their presentations too. Our presentations, their presentations will focus on the drivers and uh, response options later on. And the response options, um, we are the third part of our assessment. Uh, we assess them again at different scales, the landscape scale and also the macro scale, the global scale, um, um, referring to markets, to governance and public policies and so on. Um, I think uh, I should um, be brief with that now. <laughs> because otherwise I'm, I'm talking too long, and go on to um, some emerging findings, which are very general. Um, I took some general findings that emerged from our discussion um, one week ago. And um, first of all, um, uh, the scientific evidence, there is scientific evidence that of an increasing scientific evidence of the importance of forest and tree based systems for dietary diversity and quality, uh, especially um, through uh, um, seasonal shortfalls. There is also scientific evidence that the income from non timber forest products and ag agroforestry tree products provide significant benefits for national economies as well as for livelihoods, and that especially for um, smallholders, vulnerable smallholders in tropical countries. Um, so there's another um, finding based on scientific evidence that food and food fuel make essential contributions to food security and nutrition, and this um, aspect is often underestimated by uh, stakeholders and decision makers. Um, it's not surprising that we can confirm that the multitude of ecosystem services simultaneously supports forest production, food production, sustainability, and health. So um, that's, I mean, you could say that's common knowledge, but we can um, uh, scientifically uh, base that. And um, it's very important to state that uh, we found a lot of knowledge gaps. So that means uh, there is a gap in scientific knowledge on uh, 
different aspects, for example, on, on dry forest ecosystems, on, on cultural um, approaches to uh, foods and nutrition, and so on. And um, there is a lack of knowledge of stakeholders concerning um, f um, forest food uh, and nutrition. So food from forests and their nutritional value. And there is also um, a very important outcome that, um, which is also quite obvious, that um, the awareness of the importance of forest for food security and nutrition is very low, especially also in decision-making processes. Um, that's um, a word cloud, and it's based, okay, <laughs> I will be brief now, that, that's just food for thought now. That's a word cloud produced on, on, on draft conclusions of the different chapters we produced so far. And um, that's just, um, uh, we took out, the, of course, the obvious words like uh, forest, food, um, uh, landscape, and that's what comes out, and uh, it's interesting. And I just refer to two words. The first one is knowledge. So um, it's obvious that we need a lot of knowledge, both scientific knowledge we do not have yet, but also we need awareness and knowledge um, of decision makers. And the second word is opportunities. It's also quite in like, a large front. Uh, and um, I think our assessment will also show that forests will provide um, increasing opportunities um, to, to contribute to food security and nutrition. And I think my colleagues uh, in their presentations will also refer to that later on. And I'm coming to a close. <laughs> uh, all information and all publications of the Global Forest Expert Panels may be found and can be downloaded at the IUFRO website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph. I noticed that in the word cloud there were two words in, in both letters, women, woman, and relations. So I very much look forward also to hear more about the role of women in this particular issue. Relations, I think, is an important term because very often, you know, we think in sectors, and of course the landscape especially transcends sectoral boundaries, and the issue of food security is something that also clearly uh, transcends the sectoral boundaries. So I look very much forward to the further presentations and discussions. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Terry Sunderland. Terry is a principal scientist with Seaforce Forest and Livelihoods Program, where he leads the research domain managing trade-offs between conservation and development at the landscape scale. And naturally, he will focus on this landscape level in his presentation. Terry. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you uh, all for coming. I know there's uh, a number of com conflicting and competing uh, events this afternoon, so we're grateful that you've, you've come along to, to share our, our research and, and share your experiences too. So as Christoph has pointed out, um, he's provided a very nice overview of the framework of the GFEP process and, and how uh, the, the linkages between forest and food security are being uh, elaborated through this process. And I'd like to sort of just take a little bit of a step back and provide some of the evidence that we're talking about. Um, I'll have this here. Um, and a little bit of background. Um, we know that up to a billion people rely on forest products in some way for their livelihoods and to some degree. Um, and recent research undertaken and coordinated by C4 uh, and as part of the Poverty and Environment Network has shown that um, up to one fifth of rural income can be derived from the environment. Um, and this is a, a work that was published in a special issue of World Development just recently, uh, 14 papers related to, to the Penn project. Ruben Azi's work, uh, globally looking at bushmeat, reaffirms the importance of bushmeat for protein and, and health uh, for many rural communities. And we also are aware that um, biodiversity plays a very important role for primary health care for most people, much of this biodiversity um, being uh, forest biodiversity. And this now entering the sort of linkages between forests and farming systems, um, up to 40% of global food production does come from, from diverse smallholder agricultural systems in multifunctional forest landscapes. 
Um, and we know that there's a long tradition for managing forests for food. Think about Sweden agriculture, shifting agriculture, uh, for example. Uh, Amazonia is a fabulous example of how forests have been manipulated and managed uh, for agriculture uh, over millennia. And I'll, uh, something I'll talk about a little bit um, in a subsequent slide is work related to forest sustaining agriculture. What are the interactions at the ecosystem service level between forests and agricultural production systems? So moving on specifically to, to forest trees uh, and food and nutritional security, the, the, the type of work that we're including in the GFEP uh, um, review, is we've traditionally had a long standing, under, uh, a long standing understanding of the role of non-timber forest products. And there's a number of people in this room who I've worked with who have long histories of working with NTFPs as they are, um, and how NTFPs and multiple use uh, forest management was gonna provide the conservation uh, of forests uh, in their entirety. Um, and we also speculated that farming mosaics may, may promote more, more diverse diets, that these smallholder farming systems with their diversity of, of products uh, are more resilient to climate change, for example, but, but they are uh, more diverse in terms of nutrition and, uh, and dietary diversity as well. Um, we have uh, Henry and others here from Incraft focusing on agroforestry and farming systems, the interaction between trees on farms. Um, this is extremely important. And as I mentioned earlier, the ecosystem service is a forest and trees for agriculture. And again, I'll expand on that in a subsequent slide. Christoph mentioned the importance of uh, fuel wood, and fuel wood cannot be underestimated. Without the ability to cook food, most of it is unpalatable, and it has a huge impact in terms of human health, the ability to boil water, for example. And I saw a recent estimate that 80% of um, wood fuel um, globally was actually used to, to sterilize water, whether that's true or not, but it would actually make a lot of sense. And work also related to a lot of work that we've done on non timber forest products, looking at the, the backup foods, uh, the safety net function of, of tropical forests during lean times, particularly agriculture, or in times of climatic stress or other economic stress periods. So we wanted to test the hypothesis. What, what are the linkages really between forest food security and nutrition? And there's a paper published this year in Global Environmental Change where you can find these, uh, these findings. But basically, we took uh, USAID's demographic health survey uh, nutrition data from 21 countries in Africa and overlaid that with, with, with remote sensing analysis. So looked at basically um, the nutrition data and the tree cover data and to see if there was a relationship between uh, the two. But focusing primarily on child nutrition indicators. So the sample represented 93,000 children. You can see the, the metrics there. Um, below the ages of five uh, in over 9,500 communities, as I say, in 21 different countries. So what is the relationship? Well, there is a very positive relationship between tree cover, dietary diversity, and nutrition. And we find that fruit and vegetable consumption increases to a certain degree, up to about 45 to 50% of tree cover. The level of nutrition and dietary diversity is higher. That spatial segregation has very much characterized landscape management or the way we think of landscapes. Or well, there's this temporal segregation that different functions on the same unit of land. Think of Sweden agriculture, for example, or slash and burn uh, forestry. So those types of segregations have very much characterized the way we manage our tropical landscapes. But the one thing that's been highlighted by this GFEP process is that in many instances, and when you think about the diversity of, of uh, smallholder farmers who are able to integrate agriculture, forestry, and other land uses in very small areas of land, we're talking about functional integration, the real multifunctionality that the kind of thing really does promote conservation, it promotes forestry conservation in particular, but also um, does not affect uh, productivity of agricultural systems concerned. So we're talking about real multifunctionality, and that's, here we are, the Global Landscapes Forum, talking about integrating land use function along those lines. Um, so just to summarize the key conclusions of, of the, the types of work that we've been doing as part of the, uh, the GFEP review is, Obviously, the evidence is showing us that diverse uh, forest and tree-based production systems do offer advantages over monocrops because of their adaptability and, and resilience to climate change in particular, because of their diversity, because of the, the you don't put all your eggs into one basket, if you like, uh, economically or environmentally. There are a multitude of ecosystem services provided by forests and trees, which have an invaluable uh, provision aspect um, for, for food production, um, but also for um, sustainability and environmental and human health. And human health, I think, is the next part of the chain that we need to start looking at. What are the relationships between forest, trees, dietary diversity, nutrition, 
and health seems to be the, 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 the next step. And we've seen recent uh, outbreaks of Ebola which have been linked um, in West Africa to um, deforestation. Again, evidence is, is scanty, but it's something that's worth uh, investigating and, and looking at. Um, and in fact, we had a meeting with USAID in, um, in September, and they, well, they, would have, they wanted to focus basically on uh, us reporting on the money that they give us related to food security and biodiversity. But 80% of the discussion was about the linkages between forestry and zoonosis, and particularly Ebola. So this is entering the sort of uh, public consciousness and the donor consciousness, something that we need to step up to the plate and, and, uh, and think about how we research and, and integrate some of these things into at the landscape scale. And I mentioned this issue of multifunctionality, combining fruit production, biodiversity conservation, and other land uses to achieve food and nutritional security by also maintaining the landscape functions that we're, we're referring to. But there is a big caveat, and, and it's forests and trees alone are not going to provide the, the, the solution to global food security. But instead of being dismissed as they've done in the past, and I think Christoph alluded to this very well, that forests and trees have never really been thought of, even in terms of uh, food security and nutrition. The data and evidence suggest that, that um, they do play an important role, not singularly, but as a, as a potential strategy, as part of a wider strategy for food security and nutrition. And I think that the GFEP review, with its political, um, uh, how should I say, connections, if you like, the sort of forum where it'll be disseminated, will be able to provide that, that, that linkage and I think influence the, the global agenda in that regard. Thanks very much for your time and I appreciate the panel inviting me to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. I apologize, the room is extremely full. We do not have sufficient chairs. So hopefully by the time the, the final report will be launched in May, Dr. Sobral, <laughs> we need to make sure that we have a room that is big enough to accommodate everybody. Really, thank you for your interest and for uh, staying despite the fact that there are not sufficient chairs. Um, I would now like to give the floor to Henry Neufeld. Henry actually heads the Climate Change Unit at ICRAF, the World Agroforestry Center, and he is also the ICRAF Fire Focal Point for CCAFs. And now I have to look at my note because that's a rather long name. It's the research program, the CGIAR research program on climate change, agriculture and food security. And not only that, he's also the focal point for FTA, which is the uh, CGIAR research program on forest trees and agroforestry. So many acronyms. Um, well, Henry, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak here and to appreciate the opportunity to, to say a few words about uh, what I have been doing in this Global Forest Expert Panel, to which I was invited as somebody who works mainly on climate change in the context of agriculture, and I thought this is not actually, not really the area I'm most familiar with, and you will notice that uh, my familiarity and my confidence in presenting areas uh, around food security and forests is indirectly related to uh, the number of words on my slides. <laughs> okay, um, so Terry was talking about the landscape scale. And obviously everything integrates at the landscape scale. Farmers, forest dwellers, they all operate at that scale, ultimately. But beyond that scale, there are drivers, and then there are response options. And that is exactly the area that I was asked to lead a chapter on, by all means. And um, so this is the topic that I will try to, to uh, refer to a little bit further. And um, thank you. Um, this slide here just shows the the range of total reliance to no reliance on forest and tree-based agricultural systems and food security, um, isolated hunter-forester gather communities on the far right, and then small-scale farmers somewhere in the middle, small-scale subsistence farmers, consumers in urban areas, they essentially become totally unrelated to food security in forests. But nevertheless, we have to deal with the whole area because if we only focus on the forest communities, the forest dwellers, we're missing out on the entire area of food production um, from trees and agricultural systems with trees in them 
from horticulture uh, and, and or uh, orchards. We're missing out a large piece of the picture if we only focus on the forest per se. And this whole GFEP panel would miss, I think, the major, uh, a major part of the picture if we only dressed the far right of this um, scale. So and that's what makes it complicated as well, because we have to integrate so many things, and many of the drivers that we're talking about are also responses. And many of the things that we consider negative at one scale might be positive at the other scale, and vice versa. Um, so the two chapters that I will briefly talk about are the chapters four and six. Uh, three and five are chapters around landscape skills, drivers and responses. Chapters four and six are the drivers and responses at macro scales, essentially. Um, and we're looking here at a very simple framework to, to address these questions, we have social, economic, policy related and environmental drivers that affect land use and forest management and indirectly have to do with food security. We have very little evidence of direct evidence, and I'm glad to say uh, that, that Terry has found this evidence uh, in, in his, his recent studies, but from the literature, and this is a literature based uh, work, there is very little direct evidence of these drivers and food security and forest management. It's all, most of it is indirect evidence. Yes, so this is just a list of the, what we're dealing with in this chapter, and I apologize for the many words, as I said. Um, we're looking at social drivers in the forest and food security nexus. Here we have the conflicts in and around forests, how they interact with food security, uh, poverty and inequality, how that addresses uh, food security, demographic change, migration, urbanization, and agrarian reform. Uh, they also address um, issues related to forests and the landscapes, and how that change essentially addresses food security. We have economic drivers, income per capita, then we have absolute and relative food prices. They make a big difference because um, the, the prices that we are talking about are um, dependent on, on, the far, on, on the people, what they are able to buy, and it, they are related to, to their total income, and part of that income can come from forests, and part of it can come from the markets. Uh, we're looking at the policies and then changes at production system levels. We look at policy drivers affecting forests and food security systems, how changing contexts and forest governance play a role. We're looking at territorial versus networked governance forms and how they might differ in the ways that uh, communities at smaller scales relate to forest and food security. And then we have environmental drivers, climate change, one of them, deforestation, forest transitions, uh, looking at invasive species and water supply. That's basically the outline of chapter four. And chapter six, and I'm, again, I will go quickly through this. Here we try to address mainly response options based on examples that have worked in different places. It's not, we want to be as practical as possible. It's difficult to find examples, but by showing examples we, that might be transferable to other areas, and we show examples that have worked in some places, that might provide opportunities for others to replicate these examples under conditions that obviously have to be place-based and context-specific. So gender plays an important role in social cultural response options. Dietary choices, education, behavioral change, they make a big part of how we can relate to uh, sustaining forests more sustainably and then ultimately how they relate to food and nutritional security. Strengthening technology for improved food security. Technologies can play a huge role, let's just think about climate information systems, as one tool that helps farmers and um, in, in landscapes manage 
their land better. And that has, dire that has consequences on food security. Uh, mobilization for forest food security and justice. This is something that I perceive is very important. There are strong drivers, particularly from urban centers, that demand from corporations that work in food that they improve their management practices. And that can have positive effects on the retailers, on, their, on their, uh, the providers of these uh, services, the, the contractors, for instance. So there is, there is possibilities in, at different scales outside of the forest to improve forest uh, protection and food security at the same time. Market-related initiatives and innovative and innovations in the governance of food systems. Um, this just talks, first of all, of a framework. Then there are some global initiatives to support responsible finance and investment. Um, here there are uh, examples that are driven by large corporations that have an interest in improving uh, land management and forest food security. There are initiatives um, at smaller scales, collaboration between uh, local and subnational governments and corporations working together through, let's say, these roundtables. These are opportunities that enable improved forest and food security management. Um, the governance responses to enhance food, forest food security linkages. We have um, tenure and governance responses, decentralization and accountability responses, market regulation responses, access to information, knowledge, and technology. All of these issues play important roles, and they actually have very little to do with the forest themselves. They are outside of the forest. I know I'm running out of time here, so, um, and there are lots and lots of messages here, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time on the messages. These are initial messages. Um, you will have the opportunities, I think, to look at these messages as they emerge further, and uh, we can talk about them, and you can ask me about these messages during the the session because I don't want to extend the time that I've been given. Um, we have messages related to the drivers and we have a couple of messages related to the responses and I'll just leave it at this point right now so that we can take it up further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, is it on? I think so. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, these were the three presentations by the panel members. We now have uh, three respondents. And by coincidence, it happened so that our three presenters happen to be male and our three respondents happen to be female. Overall, we do have a perfect gender balance if I neglect my role as a moderator. So, um, let me briefly introduce our respondents to you. First, we have Natalia Cisneros. Natalia is the Vice President of the International Forestry Students Association, a partner network of IUFRO. She has been intimately involved in organizing the youth event here at the Global Landscapes Forum, and most importantly, she is a young forester here from this beautiful country of Peru. Then we have Susan Bratz. Uh, Susan is team leader for Dryland Forests, Agroforestry and Climate Change, and she holds the position of Senior Forestry Officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And then, last but not least, and I'm not sure if I have to really introduce her, we have Victoria Tauli Corpus. Vicky appeared already several times during this Global Landscapes Forum, but nevertheless, I should mention for the good order that she is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the former chair of the UN Permanent Forum on the Indigenous Issues. Let me start uh, with you, Natalia. You represent the youth, the next generation. Which aspects, um, uh, what do you take from the presentation, which aspects do you consider to be particularly relevant from the perspective of youth? And what are the key messages that you would like to convey to decision makers in this context? involved in this session uh, and for giving us the opportunity to be heard. Um, for, well, usually uh, the youth is seen as uh, the 
future, and I would like to point out that you don't really have to wait for the future to start acting, that the youth is also here today in the present. So we can start acting and, well, working on concrete actions even today. Um, we think, well, us at SIFSA, um, we've been working along with um, partners such as I, um, I, of course, and other youth groups such as White Art and, well, with C for Safe, for example, to strengthen uh, the youth role in landscapes. And that's why we were uh, involved in the organizing process for the youth session. And it, I think it's uh, worthwhile to note that in the youth session yesterday, um, we could see that people are motivated, young people are motivated to participate. We even got over 770 applications to become either a facilitator or a moderator at the session yesterday. And people were giving really valid ideas, engaging in conversations, and being really energetic about what they were saying. So the ideas that we have are also valid. We shouldn't really have to wait for the future to start implementing them. And as for the questions, well now, um, one of the things that was mentioned yesterday that really caught my attention that actually was mentioned now, I think in chapter four, was that there is an increasing migration, especially of young people leaving the countryside or rural areas to go look for better opportunities in, in urban areas. And we should try focusing maybe on how to make urban, uh, rural areas more appealing, more attractive, so that people will want to return there, so that the youth will want to return and actually live and work there, and stop this increasing gap of differences that's between the two places. And one of the ways that we could do that would be maybe uh, increasing job opportunities in the rural areas and giving more value to uh, basic processes like food production now that we're talking about food security so, because if we do this then people will feel uh, more identified to what like they will feel proud of what's going on they will feel motivated and if there's a cultural identification then um, people will want to pre protect and preserve what they have and they will not be looking for opportunities elsewhere. And another key issue that I would like to mention is has, was also mentioned here about gender disparities and especially the role of young women in rural areas. It's something that, well, even I have lived through because at once in, in the university I was even told me by a teacher, you know, what are you doing here, you should be home taking care of your family. And even though I live in the city, you know, in other countries it's even worse. And especially in rural areas. So, um, well, it, male, males will usually tend to focus on the economic benefits of resources, whilst women will look at more of the social benefits of, of resources so if we try to integrate both um, you know sides of the full office uh, we can get a better use of the resources and I think that access to female education would be crucial for this because there's a lot of things that we could benefit from and another thing that would be well like key messages maybe to decision makers would be first of all um, recognition of informal education. Not only here, for example, in the GLF, where it's uh, international and where it's also maybe a, mid, a bit more elite, not everybody has access to this. Also, try, try to have some informal education at local levels. And also, well, youth is also, you could say a marginal group, along with other groups, but for example, here in, in the GLF, this is the only session that has youth involved somehow besides the youth session. And um, if we're talking about landscapes and having different stakeholders, then we should be taking more into account also for decision-making processes. 
not only like oh, agriculture and forestry and different stakeholders like that, but also people who look at the same issue maybe. So having uh, establishing focal points of policy making processes like sciences and policy and yes, decision making processes where we could have um, people who are actively involved in these processes who can be spokespeople for the youth and at the same time who can translate these messages back to the youth so that it's understandable for them. And well, at the youth session we try to have, uh, to, to involve also um, professionals along with the youth so that we can try to diminish the breach that's existing between both of us so that they could be our mentors, they could help us uh, find the way, they could guide us, they could advise us. So I think those would be it. Yes, let's give her a big hand. <laughs> Natalia, thank you very much for these important observations, not only on the study itself, but also uh, for pointing out that this is basically the only session here which really includes youth involvement in the session itself. So I think this is also an important lesson that can be learned to really involve youth in the dialogue about all these issues affecting landscape related um, aspects. Let me now turn to Susan Bratz. Susan, achieving food security is really at the heart of FAO's efforts and the conference on the contribution of forests for food security and nutrition that was hosted by FAO and organized by FAO last year really placed this topic very firmly on the political and in a way also on the scientific agenda. Which aspects do you consider to be particularly relevant? Which aspects of the study uh, against this background? Thank you, Alexander. Um, first, to preface my comments, just the fact that it exists, I think, is very important. Uh, there are two, I'll just read out two of the recommendations um, that were made in this international conference. Uh, one is creating incentives for great, greater collaboration between scientific disciplines, government sectors, and rural institution, institutions to synthesize scientific data and traditional knowledge on the role of forests and trees outside forests in food security and nutrition. And then the second is supporting efforts and investments to communicate knowledge on the role of trees and forests in food security and nutrition in accessible, compelling formats uh, to, mm, to key stakeholders. So basically this effort is meeting two of the recommendations, gather and synthesize that scientific information and make it available in a policy relevant, uh, policy relevant form. So thank you for moving forward on this. It's, it's a hugely important topic. Um, I'll just make a few comments based upon the presentation today, presentations today. Um, First, it's really important to raise awareness of people about the role of forests and trees um, to food security and nutrition. Uh, many people will say, what do trees have to do with nutrition? You can't eat them. Or they think, ah, it goes only as far as to forest foods. Um, now, the, this international conference laid out a very simple scheme for um, for visualizing the role of forests and trees in food security and nutrition. And it, it consists of four components. Food supply, so the availability of food, forest foods, um, and, and tree products. The same, uh, the second one is uh, accessibility to food. So the ability to purchase food that you can't actually produce yourself. And then the third is sustainability, and it has to do with some of, I think Terry spoke about this, the sustainability of food systems, and so the contribution of ecosystem services to food production systems. And the fourth category of support um, is use, food use. And that's mostly having to do with uh, fuel wood and the, the use of fuel wood in cooking nutritional foods, and also the water, uh, cooking in clean water. So this is the sort of the, um, the framework that FAO uses to analyze the roles of forests and food security. And I understand that this study uses that same framework, which I think is a simple way to get across to people that um, it's about a whole range of different actions that have to be taken 
to address food security. And there are actions that are taken both on farm, but also within the water landscape. Um, we all know that uh, farmers rely on forests and trees outside of the boundaries of the farm. Um, and yet that's often invisible or at least underestimated by people who work in food systems. And so we actually see that in, in agricultural landscapes as trees get, trees and forests get more and more um, uh, sparse or they start to disappear, that farmers start to incorporate trees into their farming systems. And so that we get a diversity of agroforestry systems because the trees aren't available in the landscape. So this is evidence of the importance of trees to livelihoods, including food security. Uh, this has then implications on how we devise policies and how do we how we deal with things like land tenure um, and So the link is very important to make between the understanding of the importance of foods food uh, forests and trees to food systems to then saying what does that actually mean in terms of managing our land and making policies to encourage um, the elements of food security to be protected. Um, and so that has to do, I think, primarily with tenure systems and tenure of land, but also the tenure of use of, or the availability, availability um, and access to use of, of resources. Um, FAO did um, work, to, uh, supported the Committee on Food Security to undertake uh, the development of some tenure guidelines. So we call them the voluntary guidelines on tenure for agriculture, fisheries, and forestry um, for food security. Uh, these lay out um, a whole range of um, best practice and guideline for, for tenure. Uh, and there's a section on, well, there's a whole range of section. One is on indigenous people and, in, and communal rights, and I think we'll hear probably more from, from Vicki about that. Um, but it lays out basically soft law that provides a basis for addressing tenure is, issues globally. This is hugely important because if people don't have access to, access to the resources, uh, they will suffer in terms of food security. That brings me to the uh, second point, which I think is very important to bring out, and it, it's appeared in some of the slides, um, and it has to do with incentives, and how do we incentivize um, practices that will allow people to have access and use of forest and tree resources. Um, we've seen uh, in Niger, probably many of you have heard the example in uh, Meridi region in Niger, where a simple change in government policy that allowed people access or rights to the trees on their lands um, that created a huge regreening of, of Niger. And so five million hectares were then replanted. This was a traditional agroforestry system, a parkland system, um, and yet with the withdrawal of rights over those trees, trees started to disappear. And so creating that positive incentive um, in terms of tree tenure had tremendous impact quite quickly in terms of uh, trees on the landscape. Uh, we also know that there are perverse incentives. Um, there are, in many countries, there, there are government policies and rules and regulations against cutting transport and sale of trees from agroforestry systems on farm. So t farmers have no incentive to actually maintain and develop the, the agroforestry systems. And so both looking at positive incentives and then reversing uh, perverse incentives is very, very important to food security. And then uh, just one last point, and that's the gender. And I'm glad that's, that's come up um, in, a couple, in, um, in a couple slides and also the, the, uh, the last set of comments. And we know that women have the primary responsibility in many places for food collection um, from forests and food preparation, um, also agroforestry systems. And so there's a huge body of knowledge and expertise in women um, for, that contribute to food security. And yet there's what we call a gender gap in food security, which is women don't have then um, 
as much, in many places, as much um, of a place in the discussions on land use planning, on forest management. They don't have access to credit. Um, there may be, men are often those that go out and do the marketing. And so, although a lot of the knowledge is held within um, the, the women in the household, then that knowledge is often not allowed to be fully expressed. That would le then lead to um, economic improvement of the, of the household. So I'll stop there. So, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Susan, especially also for pointing out the importance of supportive policy and governance frameworks. If I'm correct, Christoph, the panels always include a very truly interdisciplinary team of scientists, including political scientists. So it's important to have that scientific expertise on board of these expert panels. Wiki, let me now turn to you. One of the findings of the, or the emerging findings of the study is that many forest-related food systems are based primarily on traditional knowledge. For you as an indigenous leader, what are the main messages from this study to be conveyed to policy and decision makers. Okay, uh, well, maybe before I make the recommendations, uh, uh, I just want to make some of a few comments on the on the findings that were presented. Uh, I I really appreciate very much this uh, report because it does uh, uh, it will reinforce a lot of the issues that we have been raising before uh, before the global community, but also at the national level. Uh, I just uh, wanted to highlight, I, I think uh, even the title Forest Food Security and Land Use, I think is, uh, does not capture the, you know, the entirety of the thing because I think land rights basically is really the land right, I mean, tenure uh, rights to land and also to trees, you know, is really very important and I think the findings will also show that and there are many studies already that shows the connection between respecting uh, human rights, in particular land rights and rights to culture in relation to sustaining forests and uh, ensuring better uh, contributions of the forest to, to the problems we have. I also like the, the stress on multifunctionality because again, that is the thing that we have been fighting for even within the red negotiations and uh, that's why we have uh, put the uh, some references in the text on the, the need to really look at the multifunctional uses, the multifunctionality of forests. You know? and, and that is really where all these issues about uh, non-carbon benefits will come in, which unfortunately uh, several governments don't appreciate very much, but we think that's really crucial if we are talking of forests, because we cannot talk about forests in a singular uh, use, you know, whether carbon or monoculture, you know, we need, really need to look at it in, uh, in its multifunctionality. I also like the point about drivers, you know, uh, uh, the way that it's done, uh, the political drivers, the economic drivers and all that, because again, that is uh, something that we need to address in the policy arena. You know, how do we address with all these different uh, drivers that uh, we are seeing? Uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, that, that, that before I move to the recommendations, you know, this point that you made about, uh, about of course, food security, which is so important. We all know that many of the food, uh, a big part of the wild food that is found in the forest is really the part that, uh, that is being used by many people, in, in, in particular indigenous peoples. Uh, that's really what's uh, happening. I, li I lived in my community, which is uh, which has forest, and we always go to the forest for mushrooms, uh, bees, honey, whatever you have, you know. And now, of course, I can see in different communities. And but it's also the issue of culture and spirituality. You know, I, I, I just came from Paraguay, and I met with the Guarani, who are people who really rely on the forest. They have uh, the forest is their temple. And that is where they do all the religious and uh, 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 spiritual uh, uh, meet, uh, rituals. And the forest is gone. So they are, their whole identities and their culture and their religion is totally undermined because the forest has disappeared. And they told me that, of course, the forest is also our market. You know, that's where we get all our food and everything. So I think that, that tells us exactly why that kind of uh, relationship between forests uh, identity, culture, and spirituality is also so crucial. So I hope that can even be further 
uh, reinforced in the report. No, so uh, I, I just wanted also to comment that you know in the UFLU study which we presented, maybe it's not a complete thing, but I haven't seen any reference to indigenous peoples at all. No, and I hope there will really be reference. You know, if you talk about forests and the uh, of wild foods. It's really a lot of those are amongst us. Yeah, but even, for instance, the pastoralists in Africa, yeah, even if they, they don't, because they, of course they are going to the drylands, but they do have forests. And when there is drought in the drylands and all that, they bring the cattle to the forest. And that is what protects the cattle, who is basic, which is basically providing with the food and the dairy. You know, so that kind of relationship also has to be, be looked into because the forests are not just really, I mean, it's also for those who don't necessarily rely on forests, but for their livelihoods, that is what's important. So in terms of recommendation, I just have really one, you know. Uh, uh, this study, I hope, can be used to really bolster the the advocacy points that we are doing within the climate change negotiations, but also in the post-2015 process, you know, uh, we put there up due to uh, the work that we indigenous peoples and other NGOs have done. There is a reference there on land tenure, you know, and, for, and food security as well. And I think we need to develop some uh, indicators that will help measure that kind of, uh, how, how is that being, being addressed so that uh, when they make reports, you know, and for the post tweet, how are they implementing this? They will have references to those, and that will be important in terms of the study and the continuing monitoring. And finally, I, you know, in my organization before I even became the rapporteur, one of the main things we're doing is community participatory evaluation, uh, monitoring and uh, information systems, which also looks at all the, how is the traditional knowledge, the customary governance over forests, how are these being undermined? And I, 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 I like it that you also mentioned about the changing forest governance. When the governance over, the customary governance over forests gets lost, then that's where you will really lose a lot of those forests. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, thank you also for pointing out uh, the importance um, of the findings of this study, actually finding their way to the policy forum. And this is, in my view, the, one of the strength of these global forest expert panels. They are an initiative of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests, which brings together 14 international organizations and agencies with a mandate, a global mandate on forests. And actually, we are lucky to have with us the chair of the CPF, the Assistant uh, Director General of the FAO, Eduardo Rojas Briales. So, Eduardo will make sure that the findings will be taken up by all 14 CPF members, right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, but now it's actually your turn. We do have um, a bit of time for uh, questions, for discussion. Um, so who wants to break the ice? Yes, I can see a hand back there. Oh, yes. Uh, the mic is coming. The lady back there in the uh, third but last row on the right hand side. Yes. And if you could please briefly introduce yourself and mention your affiliation. Hi, I'm Muriel Saragusi from uh, Brazil, from Manaus, and I want to point uh, two very important uh, and, and key roles of the forest for uh, food security. One, it's a carbon sink. It's helping us to avoid uh, going to four degrees. <coughs> two degrees, we know we already are there, we, we are there. And the second one is that the forest produce water. And uh, without water, there is no agriculture, there is no production. And the, the systems, uh, I, I particularly study a lot the Amazon. Uh, the Amazon forest is key for all the food production in the rest uh, of, um, South America, down, down there, not in the Indian region, but all that Brazil produce, uh, Argentina, Paraguay, it's depending on the Amazon forest uh, water. So if we don't take this in account, we, we will be missing a huge point. So thank you very much for pointing out these two very important indirect contributions of forests to food security. I suggest that we take a few more questions before I give it back to the panel. Yes, first back there and then over here. First in the last row, the gentleman, and then the lady with the red jacket. 
my name is Jorge Chavez Tafur. I work with the ITC Foundation in the Netherlands. I would like to thank all panelists for all the issues that you have raised and highlighted. I was just wondering if the issue of food sovereignty is not also relevant and necessary to point out. Yes, thank you very much. I suggest that we also take the other question. Perhaps you could pass the microphone on to, to the lady here in the second row, in the front. Thank you. Um, so I guess that's the assumption, right? That forests provide food security. But as Beacon mentioned, you know, uh, forests are being degraded, there's lots of different activities. So I think maybe we're looking at a change in paradigm of the forest providing a good nutrition. So my question is for the gentleman from C4. So I would like to know if um, the ecosystems that you look at for forest cover were equivalent. Because that's one thing that um, I guess will make a difference if you have different ecosystems and you have areas that are naturally more forest covered than others, they might be providing much more food security than other regions. And then what will be the access of those communities to markets? Thank you very much for, uh, for these questions. Um, yes, let's take one more and then we will ask the panel to actually respond to the questions. Eh, bueno, quería preguntarles si es posible eh, que puedan recomendar a que el, los sistemas educativos en las zonas de las poblaciones indígenas eh, no sean impositivas de manera, eh, o sea, tal como pasa en, su, por ejemplo, en los países de Latinoamérica. ¿no? Eh, el sistema educativo eh, emplea la lógica lógica cartesiana que lógicamente está, está invalidado por epistemólogos eh, que tratan este, la complejidad climática ¿no? y además que los pueblos indígenas, en, por ejemplo la Aymara, de la cual yo procedo, eh, han soportado y han superado diferentes cambios climáticos eh, o diferentes eh, complejidades climáticas in, en sus más de 10.000 años como cultura. Entonces, eh, nosotros eh, nos podrán eh, considerar que somos pobres porque no tenemos sistema de agua eh, alcantarillado, pero sí que tenemos una calidad de agua. Vivimos, eh, tomamos agua de manantial, directo. ¿no? Y nosotros tenemos una agroecología que es mucho más holístico, en la, entre la cual... Por ejemplo, nuestro sistema agroalimentario comprende más de siete, siete subsistemas. Entonces, eh, en, en nuestro, nuestros jóvenes, nuestros niños, podrían aprender y podrían, inclusive, no en son de imponer, tampoco, más bien podemos compartir con, con el resto del mundo y podríamos de repente generar modelos y sistemas mucho más sostenibles y deberíamos ser mucho más, eh, digamos, eh, dialogantes con ello y no simplemente decir uh, que la educación de la manera como está o la inversión, que siempre escucho que hay que invertir en esto, que hay que invertir en esto, pero la inversión, eso se habla desde hace más de 20, 30 años, por ejemplo para mantener los bosques se ofrece 5, 5, 5 dólares por tonelada, por metro cúbico y, eh, y pues nos sabemos, somos conscientes que el sistema inter financiero internacional genera utilidades segundo a segundo millones y esas son pues muy eh, es, es un juego juego humano pero muy irracional muy loco no sé. gracias muchas gracias uh, thank you very much so you pointed out in your uh, intervention the importance of also taking into due account traditional knowledge in uh, these kind of scientific endeavors, but of course also in the decision-making processes and also in decisions about investment and so on. In my view, this is a very important observation. I can share with you that IUFRO actually had an interdisciplinary task force on traditional forest-related knowledge, which really tried to elaborate on the point to, to bring together the, uh, uh, the traditional knowledge and to, and to combine it with educational systems. So a very valid point. Now I give it back to the panel. Um, 
who actually wants to take the lead in responding to some of the questions? Any volunteers? <laughs> the questions were not directed specifically to any one of you, I believe. Please, Christoph. I think it works, Christoph. Does it work? Yes. Um, well, a few questions um, were um, directed towards the scope of our assessment and if uh, certain aspects are included or not. Uh, I start with um, the um, role of forests as CO2 sink and as water resource. And of course, I mean, um, we are aware of that and um, the study includes a uh, uh, a rather large subchapter on uh, different ecosystem services forests are providing, including um, uh, as carbon sink and as a resource and 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 uh, for water, and also as um, uh, guaranteeing water quality and quantity. Um, the second question was if we uh, address food sovereignty, we do. Um, I didn't uh, refer to that. I mean, we try to address the um, food and nutritional system as a whole, like also addressing food sovereignty, uh, access to food, um, food stability, seasonality, all, all these aspects. I didn't mention them. There was not enough time for that. And um, there was also mentioning of traditional knowledge. We do have, uh, we see traditional knowledge uh, as well as um, aspects of indigenous peoples as cross-sectoral um, issues for all our assessment and we do address them uh, throughout the assessment. Um, the same we do uh, with gender issues. Uh, we do have even a gender team taking care of that. I think that was um, the part of questions that refer to the scope of our assessment. Terry, yes, please. Christoph, could you pass on? Oh, there is a working microphone, yes. I just want to respond to the, the question from the lady in the red jacket. Um, it's a very good question. Essentially, when you take these sort of data-rich um, research projects, um, it's very difficult to understand the nuances sometimes. Um, and what we're struggling with, as I said when I, when I gave the presentation, is the nature of the tree cover we're talking about that contributes to food and nutritional security. So... I don't think, it seems that the, the evidence suggests that it's not high forest, it's not areas in, in protected areas that the hunter-gatherers, it seems to be the forest farm interface where we're having smallholders who are reliant on the calories produced in their, in their farms to a certain degree for their diets, but supplementary um, materials, leafy vegetables in particular, forest fruits which are seasonal, which contribute to the nutrition value of that particular uh, system. So we have, at the moment, six uh, PhD students working in uh, six different countries uh, of the 21 that we sampled, looking at that very nature of that relationship. What are the conditionalities of the relationships between the forest and tree cover? And as you, can, as you saw from the, the slide, the tree cover relationship, nutrition, the relationship rather, drops off around 50% tree cover. So I suspect we're talking about that farm forest interface, farms, uh, trees on farms, um, but we need to be sure of that before we, we, um, we uh, go any further down that road. But let me just say, we did a very similar, in fact, the same analysis for Indonesia, which has a completely different agrarian system. And you know what we found? Exactly the same relationships between tree cover and nutrition and dietary diversity. And if you look over your shoulder, there's a chap with his arms folded, Patrice Levin. Um, he was a long-term uh, C4 um, uh, colleague uh, and did some excellent work looking at the nutrition, nutrition transition when people move out of the forest into uh, urban areas. And this is happening a lot in Indonesia with uh, oil palm uh, and, uh, and other uh, um, uh, demographic and, and uh, land change patterns. And essentially, when people make that nutrition transition, they have access to funds. And they buy, and I'm not gonna, this is not your wording, they buy crap, basically. And they live on, they live on terrible diets. So, it's not a case of keeping people poor, but be cognizant of the fact that the bottom members of the society that, society that are in close proximity to forests and trees have better diets than those that make that transition that don't. And I think that's a, that's a very important uh, 
aspect of this food nutrition uh, nexus. And it's a very complicated one, and it's something we need to get right before the policy messages that we're talking about um, are coming out. Thanks. Um, Henry, would you also like to elaborate on some of these points? Um, yes. I think I'd like to elaborate a little bit more on um, the issue that were raised by uh, Natalia and also Susan um, and Vicky to, to the extent where they refer to regulatory frameworks, tenure, and women. I think these are very closely related. Um, regulatory frameworks can be ways in which we can improve forest food security, nutritional security, and that uh, particularly helps uh, women and other vulnerable groups if they are directed to smallholder farmers, family farmers, and, and these groups, and uh, include the youth. And um, what I think is really a, a good way of, uh, for me, this is something like, uh, like a vision, if you will, you know, and it has to do with uh, with what was also connected to the, the, the distance to markets and access to markets and the urban centers as providers of a demand for sustainable, more sustainable food and food products that can be nutritious and that often come from trees and that this, dry, this demand as cities and urban areas become more affluent can be a strong driver of rural change to uh, a more, um, yes, a positive rural change that includes agricultural and forest interfaces and um, that would then also address these issues of food security. So that's sort of, as a way of framing it, that the urban centers can become the, the areas that pull because there is a demand for the change in the rural areas, and that this can ultimately lead transfer a transformation of the entire landscape. Because we can't only look at the forest, we have to look at the forest agricultural interface. And um, just one comment, um, because it was mentioned that uh, the Amazon is a carbon sink. I mean, I, I fully appreciate that the, the Amazon and other tropical rainforests are absolutely essential as uh, Drivers of. Fortunately, they are not in net carbon sinks. They are actually, uh, because they are in balance, unless they're being deforested, is growing, they are not carbon sinks. Sorry to say that at the large scale. Thank you, Henry. Ladies and gentlemen, technically speaking, we have now run out of time, although I believe that the, the closing plenary starts at 6 o'clock, so I'm wondering if the organizers give us a few more minutes if there are some pressing questions, and I see one hand back there. So this question and another one, is there perhaps one other? Oh, these two. Let's take these three questions, and then I'm afraid we will have to end, because certainly we would not want to miss the closing plenary. So we start with the gentleman on the very left-hand side, and the in the back of the room. Thank you. I, I work in a research organization with maybe 100 forest researchers and probably 700 agronomic researchers. So when as a forester I say, okay, forests are good for food security, they say, come on, you are a small player. We are the agronomists, we feed the planet. So whatever you say is excuses to save your forest for, so somehow. But then I have arguments. So one argument you didn't mention here this afternoon is in some cases forests produce food which you cannot replace by agriculture and I give you an example in the Congo Basin for example we have figures that probably bushmeat would provide 4 million tons per year as proteins but now I have figures from my colleague working in Brazil he's working in the cattle industry and he says Brazil would produce probably 10 million tons beef per year but they export 2 million tons which is half of what Congo Basin eats from bushmeat, which means that there is absolutely no way today or in between the next 10 or 20 years to provide any alternative to the food coming from natural forest today in Congo Basin. There is no substitution, no alternative. You have to live with it. So this is one consideration I would want to add to what was said that 
try to find those fruit chain of custodies, I would say, coming from forests that cannot be replaced. They are on what people made their living on. They should be evaluated in terms of quantity, in terms of earning money, and so on. Thank you, very important observation. Let us uh, continue right away with the lady sitting next to you. So there seems to be a cluster of uh, people who want to ask questions in this corner of the room. Please. Okay, uh, my name is Miriam Ross from the University of Amsterdam. My question refers to the first presentation where a call was made for more research on the relationship between forest and food security. And then I wonder what kind of research. We have done a lot of research on non timber forest products and, and what they provide to, to uh, food security and, and, and dietary diversity. So I wonder what else do we want to know? Thank you. Um, very important aspect. And I think there was one last question also there in the back. Yes, please. My name is uh, Roderick Zacht, Tropenbos International. Uh, well, you gave some exciting insights in the positive relation between forest and, and food security, but there are also negative relations. And I was wondering whether uh, those aspects were also included and whether you can say something about the, yeah, the quantitative aspects of it. Yes, thank you. All very good points. I would ask the respondents um, to be very brief um, with the responses. That includes, or actually the panelists, that includes the, the panel members and the respondents. So please feel free to respond. But please, not more than one minute, because we really need to bring this session to a close. So, uh, Christoph, there was this more general question about uh, research that um, related to these issues. Uh, perhaps you could again explain the principle of GFAP, how it works, because I think that answers the question. Okay, um, I'm not sure if I fully got your question because it was um, uh, 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 quite loud. Um, but I, I guess it's about um, what kind of um, um, uh, scientific information we do assess. I mean, we do assess uh, existing scientific information. We do not do our own research. Of course, some of our panel members do have already done research, or a lot of them, on, on, on different aspects uh, um, of forest and food security. And, uh, but our assessment is based on existing and available scientific information. And what we try is to um, uh, uh, assess and synthesize um, this information and uh, um, conclude um, the most important uh, aspects and, and summarize them in um, key messages. So that's the approach we do have. I, I understood that you made a call for more research on the topic. And then ah, what yes. Ah, oh, oh yes. Uh, sorry, yeah. I, I did a, <laughs> sorry, I didn't get that. Yeah, um, we found out that uh, we found a lot of gaps actually um, in, in, in the scientific information. Um, I mean, uh, for example, um, starting from, from aspects of a uh, role of different forest ecosystems for food security, we do not have a lot of information on dry forests, for example. Uh, we do not have a lot of information on some socioeconomic aspects, cultural aspects, for example. I think there is a uh, lacking information, on, uh, quantitative information on, on, on income of um, small scale holders. There is, as far as I remember, then, um, there is um, a lack of, of data on, on, on cultural aspects of nutrition. Um, I, I do not um, know all that by heart now. <laughs> but um, we, we will have um, one, at, at least once, one subject or three paragraphs just on knowledge gaps in our conclusions. We just started to draft them, I have to say. So it was, it's just in discussion now. So the one minute, that was a rather long minute, but the, the, the thing is that the report will be published in May and then we will be able to read the knowledge gaps that always form part of these reports. Then we had these questions about the food uh, systems and you know the food chains that cannot be substituted, the forest-based food chains that cannot be substituted by any other ways. Who wants to uh, respond to that question? Wiki. Well, I think that's, uh, that's a very, uh, <clears throat> for, for me, that's uh, something good to hear because then that justifies further the need to really protect these uh, systems that, that 
that can only happen within that context. And uh, and if if this report is going to come up with such a conclusion, it will definitely be something that will strengthen the advocacy for these kinds of issues. You know? So I, I I hope that kind of uh, uh, observation can really be reflected in your report. Thank you, Vicky. Susan, you would also like to add. Yeah, just um, you you raise the point of nutrition, and I think that's really important. Um, that we don't look at forests so much for absolute number of calories. We look at forests often as a diverse or a source of diverse um, uh, vitamins, minerals, and and that is a big distinction um, that you can't always get what you need from um, on farm through you know a, a small number of crops. Um, and so whether you're you're taking a diverse system and making let's say a home garden that's very diverse and then you get the diversity built into your 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 plot or whether you actually have to go outside and, and collect those things that add diversity important diversity for nutrition um, that's that's the other way to do it but but I think making the distinction between food and calories and nutrition is a really important one to make in looking at how you treat treat forest and tree resources Thank you, Susan. And finally, we had this question about whether it's all just positive or whether there is also perhaps a negative aspect of you know, promoting for, us for, for, for food security, forests and trees for food security and nutrition. So are there some kind of uh, red lights that we should be aware of? Does the study give any evidence for this? Can I answer a positive one? Terry? <laughs> that was a brief answer. I wanted to address, um, address both the issue that sort of links Miriam's question um, and Alan's question. Uh, researchable topics. We talk about sustainable intensification, we talk about land sparing, land sharing, all these horrible you know, buzzwords that have crept into the whole landscape approach uh, discourse. More, more research needs to be done on what, the, what integration of forestry and agriculture actually represents on the ground. I think that's a fundamental one. And another one for me, I, I see that. NTFPs, bushmeat, there's two sides of the triangle, and I see fish as the other one. Inland waterways and fisheries are incredibly important in terms of forests, and I think that if you're talking about rep um, substituting bushmeat, the protein value of fish is extremely important in all the forest uh, basins of the world, and it's a big, big gap in terms of our research knowledge. Uh, the negatives, Roderick, I didn't quite understand what you meant by the negatives. Well, like Oh, okay, that, that's such a good point. That's come out in our systematic review, uh, looking at forest versus agriculture. And I didn't put the negatives up there for obvious reasons, from C4, so global landscapes for But you're right, there are some negative uh, correlations between proximity of forest and trees to, to certain crops, yes. So, thank you very much. Now we really need to bring this session to a close. Let us give a very big hand to our presenters and to our respondents. I would just like to very briefly acknowledge also the support by our donors for these projects. These are the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland, the United States Forest Service, and the Austrian Federal Ministry for Agriculture, Forest, Environment, and Water Management. And then something about UFRO. Actually, I came uh, from the UFRO World Congress almost directly here. Uh, and one decision that was taken at the UFRO World Congress was that the next Congress will be held in 2019 in the beautiful city of Curitiba in Brazil. So the big UFRO World Congress will come to this continent and although it will take place only five years from now, I nevertheless all want to cordially <laughs> invite you to attend that Congress. With that, I thank you very much um, and wish you um, a remaining uh, nice and enjoyable rest of the Landscapes Forum.